So there's a West African proverb um, that says, a, su a successful man is one that can sit by the river for a whole day without feeling guilty. And that proverb always reminds me of um, a man who works in my estates back home. So I'm from Nigeria, and back home I live in a pretty secure estate, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> and um, there's this, we have a group of guards, but then we have those that do the opening and the uh, getting up to open the gates, those ones that have some kind of matches mode to show us. But then we have this other old, lanky um, guard who sits really close to my house. And I don't think his job is to protect us physically. I think it's to protect us mentally. And how does he do this? He sits down on his white plastic chair for about seven hours a day, and he weighs. Absurd, I know. But he has a kind of process to it. You see, he starts off with this slow, assured smile that tells you, don't worry, you'll smash whatever interview you have, or the kind that tells you, don't worry about it, tomorrow will be better. And then he just sends us off on our way with a slow and steady wave, almost to the sound of his own music. And isn't that just beautiful? I mean, when compared to the hellos and highs I get these days, I don't know if Someone is warning me about a moving car or trying to say hello and hi. But a slow, steady waving. Isn't that just beautiful? But unfortunately, I was, too, I was too distracted by the little people in my head. They kept nagging me with questions like, how does someone derive a sense of pleasure from a job that thrives on the absence of change and the repetition of one basic notion? What does his wife think about him? Are his kids disappointed in him? I just, I wanted to know, I needed to know if he hated himself as much as I would if I were in his shoes. Or more appropriately, his white broken down plastic chair. <laughs> and a successful man is one that can sit by the river for a whole day without feeling guilty. Eventually, I realized that his story is not one about doing it big. It's one about doing it and finding what to love in every moment of it, no matter what it is. The Waver story is one of redefining success. Now, I've had many moments of redefining success, but I remember um, one that really stuck with me was earlier this year when I went to, um, Harvard, for, I went to Harvard for a conference and we attended a woman leadership in Africa panel. And one of the panelists opens up boasting about all her board memberships. I'm on the board of this, I'm on the board of that. And then she says, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and I'm a businesswoman, and I'm winning on all three fronts, and you have no choice but to do so. And I, I'm like, okay, all right then. <laughs> and then she continues and she says, as women, you have no choice but to do all that so that people don't think that you're unable to fulfill your other duties. And at that point, me, myself, and I, we just had to have a meeting in my mind because I was thinking, yes, I can biologically reproduce. Yes, I can get employed. And yes, I can get married. But do I want to do all three? But more importantly, is it okay if I don't want to do all three? Sitting there, I... I realized that one of the early steps to redefining success comes with the agency to say, I deserve the right to reject a standard definition that exists, but does not take my uniqueness into consideration. And I did not say strangeness or weirdness, I said uniqueness. And I remembered Rory Sutherland who said, you know, the circumstances of our lives may matter less when compared to the sense of feeling we get from having control over our lives. Anyway, Mrs. Fantastic was Nigerian, so <laughs> I didn't really expect anything different because I myself have been in that system where a woman is expected to be everything to prove that she can be something. I've lived through having those narrow expectations for myself and calling them ambition. From an early age, I learned that you have to be 
ugly or lazy if you were struggling in life. And so I was running. I was ru like a hamster on a wheel. I was, I was running away from life struggles because let's be real. Who wants to be ugly or lazy? I knew it wasn't me, so I kept running. But eventually, I became overwhelmed because the more I ran, the more I lost my breath. You know, I was dying to be what they said I should be instead of living as myself and loving every moment of it. Inevitably, I became exhausted. But life itself is a struggle. Sir Aga Khan III said, struggle is the meaning of life. Defeat or victory is for God, but struggle is man's duty and should be his joy. Life itself is a struggle. And one of the tactics to redefining success comes when we realize that life is the up as much as the down, but we need to appreciate both, but it depends on how we see the negative scenes of our past. Changing that perspective is everything. My friend Priscilla once challenged me um, when she asked me to cherish sadness. She, in a recent blog post, she wrote about her friend, Amy, who had a huge conversation with a tree. I clearly need new friends. But she <laughs> told me that she had a huge conversation with a tree. To be this grand, the tree told her. I must reach up into the sky where it is bright and beautiful, but I must also dig deep into the earth where it is damp, unpleasant, cold, and lonely. Life itself is a struggle. You don't have to be ugly or lazy to feel it. But more so for a girl like me. <laughs> you know, I... I grew up in a world where I was, ex instead of exploring myself and finding things to love about myself, I was too busy tearing myself apart from what I saw in the mirror because she was not who I saw on the cover of the magazines. Apparently, six out of ten girls are refusing to take part in intellectually stimulating classroom activities like debates because they feel they do not look good. And if you think this is just about immature teens, Megan Ramsey of the Dolph Self-Esteem Project also says that 17% of women are not showing up to job interviews on days where they feel they do not look good. And I remember that Caroline Heldman explained this in another TED Talk where she said, girls are taught that they are their bodies, while boys are taught to use their bodies as vehicles to dominate their world. And I can understand that because thinking back to my high school days, I never really bothered exploring school. I mean, school was great, but it was secondary. I remember choosing history over chemistry. And don't get me wrong, because I loved history. But I would never, ever do chemistry. And because I thought the girls who, did chemistry, who were great at chemistry were extraordinary, but then I thought the girls who did horribly at chemistry were out of their league, as girls, of course. But this was not just about my school or my teachers. Many loved ones unintentionally placed limits on my ambition. Because see, you can tell me to be president, you can tell me that I can be president of a country, but how can I be president of a country when I know I have to be back home at 5 p.m. so that I don't get raped? How can I be president of a country when I know that I cannot protect myself from the random man in the streets of Lagos who can grab my ass as he wishes, or the ones in the streets of Nairobi who can strip me when they feel I'm not appropriately dressed? How can I protect a country from war or the zombie apocalypse? I don't know. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to think back on myself and I realized that instead of encourage me to create, encouraging me to create a world where all my dreams were valid, a lot of these people were encouraging me only to dream dreams that could be valid for my female self in this flawed patriarchy. Um, I really, I, I remembered that it, it took a toll on trying to figure out what success meant for me, because I was, I was doing what they said was my best. I was getting good grades, but the memory of my A just didn't 
make me smile hard or long enough. Because Albert Einstein, who is usually right about everything, was right again when he said, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Tongue twister, I know. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. Today, our society is fascinated with numbers and data. We have Twitter retweets, we have Instagram likes, we have voting, dating websites, all dealing with data and numbers. And these are all considerably important. But how can we include what should count? How can we create a habitat of happiness? I don't know the answer to that, but it takes me back to my days at the African Leadership Academy. And I remember I was surrounded by so much difference. These are, I was surrounded by people from over 40 different countries. And it became hard for me to see or find scraps of my self-esteem within just one sheet of paper. I mean, you're waking up to so much difference. Sambonane, bonjour, hello, what's up? <laughs> different accents, different clothes, different colors. Everything was different. And so words like weird or ugly just became harder on my heart and heavier on my lips. You see, because I realized that those words were normally my way of justifying my search for this thing called perfect. I mean, sat back then, satisfaction just looked like laziness. Why are you smiling when you don't have an, a Grammy on your, um, on your table? Why are you smiling when you're not a famous musician? I just, didn't, I just didn't understand why people were happy when they were just students. It just didn't make sense to me. Because back home, it didn't matter if you had a 99.9 average as long as someone else had 100. You know, people would say, does the person that came first have two heads? <laughs> and perfection just looked like laziness. Because I thought it was a justification for myself as a failure. I thought that I couldn't trust myself enough to believe that I could be satisfied with who I was, but still find the drive and motivation to create ways for the world to work better. And now that I've mentioned the F-bomb, which is failure, let's talk about failure. I think failure, the fear of failure is one of the greatest threats to achieving greatness. Recently, I met a man who, a great man who told me perfection has no destination. Profound, I know. <laughs> I met a man who said perfection has no destination. And if we think about it, if perfection has no destination, where are we going to? I think back to my days in high school where um, I never really learned or remembered anything I learned. But not because I was dumb, but because it was irrelevant to me. Back then, I didn't want to ride the wave of my school. I just wanted to jump over that hurdle with an A, of course. But if perfection has no destination, how many hurdles will I jump to win a race that doesn't exist? Who determines how many meters I should run? And why the hell are we running so fast to win something that doesn't exist? Unfortunately, I never got to have a conversation with my friend, the waiver. So I don't know if he grew up dreaming of becoming a waiver in my estate, or I don't know if he simply could not afford medical or law school, but that is not the story today. This is not a ploy to gloss over the harsh reality of poverty. This is an example of a man who found that he has value. His inherent self has value, and there are people that need his presence. He found a wave to ride so that he can stay alive tomorrow for the people that love him at home and the people that need him at work. <sighs> I, I really believe that the waiver story is really important for all of us because nobody, female or male, no matter what gender you are, should ever have to fight to prove that they're everything, to prove that they're worthy of respect. You do not have to fight to be everything to prove that you are something small, something large, something powerful, and something great. You see, many of us are on a rat race to our ideal sense of perfection, but I can tell you that that race is one of endless grief. And I believe that a system based on endless grief is unsustainable. 
We're led to believe that happiness is a cake that we can bake with one recipe. But you cannot, I repeat, you cannot cut and paste someone's happiness onto your heart. So find ways to amplify your drive. Surround yourself with new people that can tell you new things about life, that think differently about life and about you. Invest time in your passion and fulfill it so that your usefulness to yourself may give you reason enough to resonate that genuine pleasance of the waver. You know, you have to find something within you that can give you reason enough to resonate genuine pleasance, if not through a wave, but maybe through a smile. Because even though life is a struggle, it is not bigger than you. It is because of you. Wallace Schoenkau once said, even though the river may rise high, it has never covered the, fish, the eyes of a fish. A while ago, I was on my way back from somewhere, and I saw a bench that I had passed all the time. And I realized, wow, Sheila, you've never just taken good use of the bench and sat down. So I, I sat down, and I was just staring at the streets. And I realized I had never just looked out into the street for no reason. I was always going to somewhere or coming from somewhere. And so I sat down. And the feeling I got, it'll take another year to explore and explain. But what I can say is I agree. A successful person is one that can sit by the river for a whole day without feeling guilty. <laughs> Thank you for listening.